Michael Sandel, professor of government theory at Harvard University, author of many well-received books, including Democracy's Discontent. And this updated version is Democracy's Discontent, a new edition for our perilous times. Um, it's an update to your, your landmark 1996 book. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for coming on today. It's good to be with you, Emma. I, I, so I, I'm sure you get this question basically in every interview that you do about this book. Like, why did you feel the need to update it? I mean, haven't politics been a pretty quiet since since 1996? <laughs> <laughs> hardly, hardly. <laughs> in 1996, things looked pretty good. Peace, prosperity, the really the apex of faith in the Washington consensus, in the market-based globalization, in the deregulation of the financial industry. And everything seemed on the surface uh, to be pretty good. But one of the main themes of the first edition back in 1996 was that just beneath the surface, uh, there, there were discontents swirling about uh, the democratic future. And in particular, uh, the worry that citizens were feeling a sense that we didn't really have much voice in how we were governed, and the moral fabric of community was unraveling, and the market-based individualist ethic that seemed to animate our politics would not sustain us for long. And I worried that the, the moral void in our public discourse would open the way to uh, to hypernationalism and fundamentalism, voices calling to take back our culture, Emma. That was my worry back <laughs> in the mid 1990s. Well, that's aged very well. I mean, it, it's it. What is that like to have some of your kind of most well documented predictions on this front kind of come to pass and watch that? train wreck in slow motion. I mean, it's not just the United States. That consensus right. of neoliberalism and globalization that you describe is also fo foundational in what we saw in Brexit. It's foundational in what we're seeing in the rise of autocrats on the right, like Viktor Orban, um, like Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil uh, and elsewhere. I mean, you could even say Narendra Modi in India. Like yes. the, even from, from a global perspective, too, did you see... Were you surprised at how the scope of a kind of rapid disintegration in faith and democracy and communitarian politics, how global that that was? Well, I, I can't say that I predicted the global backlash against the neoliberal version of globalization and seeing it come to pass. If it's a mixed blessing, I mean, it's it's one thing to. Uh, feel that one's concerns have been borne out by events, but those events uh, are pretty dangerous and frightening for the future of democracy and the prospect of self-government. But you're right, Emma, it has been a global backlash. The heady self-confidence um, of, uh, of those years, um, I think, First, had a, first kind of come up and with the financial crisis of 2008, when the whole project of and the, and, and put forward with great confidence and even smugness by governing elites and by mainstream economists who were advising the, those elites, uh, that came crashing down with the financial crisis of 2008. But what the same governing elites and their economists brought us was not a fundamental rethinking of uh, the role of finance in a democratic uh, society. Instead, they put the system back together again. And while they instituted some, some protections to try to prevent another systemic meltdown and certain protections for uh, consumers of financial products. We did not have a fundamental debate about the role and reach of markets in a democratic society or about the role of finance. And so uh, I think that the anger that came with the bailout, and it was on the right and, and on the left, the left we had the Occupy movement, 
and then the energized Bernie Sanders campaign of 2016. And on the right, the Tea Party movement, ultimately the election of Donald Trump. So the sense of injustice that was held underground in the aftermath of the bailout found expression in politics and it contributed to the gathering resentments and anger and sense of grievance that, well, that found dark uh, fruition in the election of Trump and Brexit in Britain, as you say, and in many other uh, authoritarian populists in uh, around the world. So the question now is, can we rethink uh, the, the structure of the economy, reconfigure it in a way that is more amenable to democratic politics and control. I, I it struck it struck me when you know researching your book for for today how you you talk about this concept of of meritocratic hubris among yeah. elites and how it really is striking how Trump and the Republican Party were able to really pivot quite quickly and target credentialism as a as a way to make it seem as if they're going after elites um as you know ten cruz talks about uh harvard harvard elites and he went to princeton and yale right and and like same desantis went to yale it's it's so but but the, their messaging is kind of what really matters on that way and then it also is a way for them to go after doctors and scientists so it has the trappings of populism but none of the teeth of it and i i it, it it as you say it was a real missed opportunity for the left and the democratic party not to feel that moment and understand we have to provide a more robust and uh and, and important alternative uh to this which is really i think where you can see why trump got elected emma i think that's that's right what we had with trump was a kind of plutocratic populism, a faux populism. But it's not enough uh, simply for for those of us, uh, say, to the left of center, to say how terrible Trump was and to point out the hypocrisy of massive ta tax cuts for the wealthy and for corporations uh, carried out by a supposed populist. It's not enough. It's also important for us to ask the question, what was it that he was appealing to that, that we missed, that mainstream Democrats and mainstream Republicans missed about the mounting anger and frustration? And this goes to what you were saying a moment ago about credentialism, because part of when along with the widening inequalities brought about by neoliberal globalization. We're changing attitudes towards success. Those who landed on top during the past four decades came to believe that their success was their own doing, the measure of their merit, and that they therefore deserved the full measure of the bounty the market bestowed upon them. And by implication, that those who struggled must deserve their fate as well. This is the meritocratic hubris, the kind of credentialist prejudice that made many working people feel that elites were looking down on them. And just as you point out, there are people who've been educated at elite institutions who are trying to articulate that same message, the one put forward by Trump. But until until we <clears throat> until we have a kind of more genuine populism that addresses the structure of the economy and the dignity of work i think that the that the suspicion of many working people against credentialed meritocratic elites and professionals and experts will persist there's also the fact that along with neoliberal globalization and a kind of credentialist meritocracy came a, a technocratic view of politics, the idea that we're beyond ideology now, 
that it's for experts to determine the shape of the economy, the deregulation of finance, the, the trade agreements that outsource jobs to low wage countries. These were all promoted in the name of expertise, the expertise of economists. And I think that the anger and resentment against those arrangements and against the widening inequalities they produced led to a deep suspicion of experts and expertise. And we saw it, we saw the bitter fruits of that during the pandemic, when the, the suspicion of expertise extended beyond the economists who had brought us this uh, into this fix to public health figures and Dr. Fauci and, and uh, those public health experts who were trying mm -hmm. to give advice on how to deal with the pandemic. Yeah, I would say that there's also a, uh, the, the kind of secondary effects of that are that people then feel empowered by being their own experts and doing their own research. It's like this democratization of credentialism through online discourse where I've always said that, you know, the conspiracy theories of like anti-vax stuff are a way for people to feel empowered over their healthcare and over their kind of uh, place in society that values that kind of cr credentialism or seems to do so um, in terms right. of where they are at in the economic ladder. And it, it, it feeds uh, a like this insatiable kind of uh, desire to not feel so alienated from our right. politics and our society. And, and it leads people down roads of further alienation as they get into these kind of subcategories uh, through you know, again, conspiracy theory online. Yes, and, and I think we, we should not underestimate the extent to which this alienation has partly to do with uh, higher education and the role that universities have come to play. Mm -hmm. Not only did they produce the experts who gave us with great confidence the version of market-driven finance-driven uh, globalization that led to the widening inequalities. But as, as uh, working people faced stagnant wages in real terms for four decades in the outsourcing of jobs, the mainstream politicians, center right and center left, offered the following solution. You remember what they said, if you wanna compete and win in the global economy, go to university, get a college degree, what you earn will depend on what you learn. You can make it if you try. This is what I call the, the rhetoric of rising. But there was an insult implicit in that rhetoric. The insult was this. If you're struggling in the new economy and you don't have a college degree, your failure must be your fault. That's the implication. We told you to better yourself to go to college so that you too could compete in the economy that we designed. But the problem is most, most people don't have a four year college degree. Most Americans don't. Um, nearly uh, over 60% do not. So it was folly to create an economy that set as a necessary condition for dignified work and a decent life, a college degree that most people don't have. So this is one of the ways in which uh, uh, those mainstream politicians created the, the resentment and also the backlash, not only against elites, but against universities who have now become a target for many on, on the right. For um, uh, And I think it, it's because of the role universities and the promise that a college education would be your way of contending with the inequality we created that has led to a lot of that anger. Yeah, and then that that same party kind of, uh, and, and frankly, the Democrats are not good on this either, ha have yeah. have not created any kind of bridge to make education, higher education, more accessible to people. I mean, right now, the student loan cancellation is tied up in court, but should have canceled all of it. I mean, and then that's, I guess, on the back end, but still, you look at some of what the cost of what paying for college would be and it's peanuts compared 
to what the federal government pays for in terms of a free college program on military increases on a yearly basis. So that's a bit of an aside. But I, I you... but could I pick up on, on sure, that aside, sure. which is important, Emma, which yeah. is we also have to pay attention to the full range of educational opportunities that we as a country are supporting. An economist at Brookings uh, compared the amount we spend helping people go to uh, four-year colleges with the amount we spend on supporting community colleges and technical and vocational training centers. And she found that we spend, this was some a few years ago, 164 billion helping students go to college. That's a good thing. But only 1.1 billion on community colleges and vocational and technical training. This is a vast disproportion, which really reflects the neglect of the educational uh, institutions where most, uh, most of our fellow citizens prepare themselves for the world of work and for that matter of citizenship. So this too reflects, this neglect reflects a kind of credentialist prejudice that is deeply at odds with the dignity of work, which I think should be, uh, should be the focus of progressive politics, focus less on arming people for meritocratic competition and focus more on the dignity of work, making life better for people who contribute through the work they do and the communities they serve to the common good, whether or not they have a four-year degree. Yes. Um, and again, the, the, just to add, the purchasing power of a four-year degree is also going down as well. Um, yeah. and, and so it's, it, it's a bunch of compounding factors. I, I want to return to what you were saying a little bit before, um, or I guess it's connected, but you make a, you differentiate between two forms of liberalism in your book. Um, there's procedural liberalism and uh, egalitarian liberalism, which I think is the kind of the, the mainstream consensus of what they think a liberal is or what liberalism is. To take our audience through that kind of differentiation, if you don't mind. Yes, it's really a, a contrast, <clears throat> Emma, between two different ideas of freedom. Freedom is a central American value. And we hear a lot about freedom these days, especially by uh, Republican candidates who say Democrats are against freedom. So uh, there is a kind of debate about freedom. But what this debate misses are two conceptions of freedom that I, I discuss in Democracy's Discontent. There is a, a purely individualist idea of freedom. Even you might call it a consumerist idea of freedom that says, I'm free in so far as I can get what I want, satisfy my desires, consumer welfare. But this is, this, I try to contrast this with what I would call a civic conception of freedom that says being free in the sense of a consumer having access to the abundance of this country and the economy, that matters. But it's not the only thing that matters, and it's not the only part of freedom that counts. Really to be free is to have a voice, a meaningful say in how we are governed. The civic conception of freedom I describe in the book is the ability to deliberate with fellow citizens about the meaning of a just society and the purposes and ends that we should pursue. And it's that civic conception of freedom, I argue in the book, that's been crowded out by the purely market-based individualist consumerist idea of freedom. Mm. So really, democracy's discontent, I think to address democracy's discontent, we need to revive and reconnect in our politics with the civic tradition, the civic conception of freedom, which means we have to ask, what economic arrangements are compatible with self-government and with democracy, which leads to questions about the role of antitrust, reigning in big business, including the tech companies, 
and giving people a meaningful say as citizens, not only as consumers, in how our collective life will be determined. It, it, it's so well said, and it really is, I would say, um, you know, I was born in the 90s. I think since the 90s on, the conception of one's citizenship in the United States, even in protest, is so connected to one's consumer, consumer choices that, you know, the civic uh, flexing of one's citizenry in like the mid 20th century in protest and in action is so radically different than what my generation perceives of its ability to use its power in in the U.S. in the 21st century, which is so based on consumption that I feel like there needs to be some sort of renaissance where millennials and the younger generation understands how to be civic participants, even if we're so atomized and even if, uh, you know, our economic system feels so many layers separated from our practical day to day realities. Yes. And it's not easy to lean against the forces and the habits of consumerism uh, as exhausting our conception of what it means to be free which raises the question, well, how, how might we begin to do that? I think we see, and I try to show in, in the book, how in moments in our past, there have been powerful social movements that involved genuine political debate about big questions in a way that gathered people together. The civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s is one example the movement the uh, anti-vietnam war protest movement was another more recently the black lives matter movement that uh, gained momentum in the aftermath of the george floyd killing these are glimmers of a civic ambition um all involve conflict all involve struggles for justice and all involve political debate and argument. So the civic conception of freedom uh, is compatible with disagreement, with pluralism, with challenging uh, existing arrangements. But in these moments, I think we're recalled to an older civic tradition of freedom. And then there are other institutions within civil society we could debate and consider as ways of shifting our civic education away from a purely consumerist orientation. Some have, have proposed, and I have sympathy for it, but I'd, int I'd be interested to know, Emma, what you think, some kind of universal national service program mm. might like be Like in Scandinavia, way. right. Well, right. what do you think? Would you, would you be sympathetic? I would be as long as it's, you know, I'm on the left. I, I would love for it to be civil service that's not a funnel into, say, you know, the military, for example. I, 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 I have my fears about that. But right. that's honestly, you know, my, my grandfather was a, was a socialist. And that's what he would tell me when I was a kid, that it was so much better because my grandma was from Finland. How over there they would require civil service and, and that would bring people a, a better conception of, of citizenry. And I'm, I've am i always been sympathetic to that kind of idea. Um, right. But, and it could be broadened beyond military service to include other forms of, of service, whether in, in uh, providing forms of care, the healthcare industry, education, um, the building of infrastructure. There, there are lots of things we need. We need more public investment in general, both in fiscal terms but also, I think, in, in human terms and in ways that elicit participation, but also, and this is as important as the projects themselves, that bring people from different backgrounds, different class backgrounds, different ethnic and racial and religious backgrounds into shared experiences, common projects. Uh, because part of uh, one of the most corrosive effects of the inequalities that have been widening in recent decades is that those who are affluent and those who are of modest means increasingly live separate lives. We send our kids to different schools. We, we live and work and shop and play in different places. 
And this isn't good for democracy. Democracy doesn't require perfect equality, but it does require that people from different backgrounds encounter one another in the course of their everyday lives, because this is how we learn to, to negotiate and to abide our differences. And this ultimately is how we come to care for the common good. So rejuvenating the public places and common spaces of shared democratic citizenship, I think that has to be part of any attempt to revive the civic conception of freedom that I, I describe and I'm trying to evoke in the book. How much of it, though, is just strengthening our social institutions? Like, no more charter schools. We're not splitting up our... And again, this is kind of wish fulfillment, but if I were to to, to be queen tomorrow, and what what would I determine? You know, no, we're, we're yeah. going to make the, our public institutions as robust as possible. Um, you know, we're not siphoning off public money for a religious school in Oklahoma or wherever they're just they're making that decision right now. Or we're not we're 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 going we're going to have a universal health care system so that the the people are not tether, uh, torn apart by um, kind of. Uh, very individualized private healthcare experiences. I mean, to me, I, I, it seems like that's only part of the equation for you, but I, I think that's such an important part. <laughs> well, what I do think uh, is important is to strengthen public institutions and public provision of essential goods. So that the original idea of the public schools going back to Horace Mann was not only to uh, create schools that would be accessible to those regardless of financial means. That was a very important part of it. But he also took seriously the class mixing character of the public schools. And so I think part of what we have to do in rebuilding the civic infrastructure of a, of a shared democratic life is to make public institutions good enough and strong enough and well-funded enough so that everyone will want to participate in them. So the public schools should be good enough and strong enough so that parents from the affluent part of town will want to send their kids there. And public transportation could be good enough and clean enough and reliable enough so that everyone will want to use it, not only those who can't afford, you know, private cars or drivers or something such as that. And I would say I would say the same for public libraries, public parks and recreational areas, public uh, uh, workout facilities, so that people don't feel the need to secede even from those to uh, enroll in private health clubs. So the health of democracy depends in part on the strength of the public institutions within civil society that not only provide services, but do so in a way that brings us together. It's community building, it's civic education by inadvertence in a way, but over time, when we find ourselves in the same spaces and public places, availing, of our, uh, availing ourselves of services and education and healthcare and recreation, we come to see one another as fellow citizens engaged in a common project. And that, I think, is necessary to any attempt to bring about a politics of the common good. So, yes, I mean, I, I, that was one thing I should have added, the, the, the preponderance of more public spaces. That's so, I mean, I'm here in Brooklyn and or here in New York. It's just this constant conversation about oh, I don't want to see homeless people on my streets and um, places like coffee shops being cashless because they don't want homeless people using their bathrooms. And it's because we have no public spaces left in this country in many ways anymore. And I think that that is really a lot of what you're talking about here, too, which is the the financialization of our politics, the neoliberal consensus being so hard to break through here. And I guess that'll be my, my real final kind of question is um, what are some of the glimmers of hope that you're seeing in breaking that consensus? Um, because I do think like right 
Now, in the Biden presidency, I feel more hopeful that that cons consensus is being broken than I did during the Obama presidency. Yeah, well, that's interesting yeah. because uh, Joe Biden has been around for a very long time. <laughs> And we think of him as, a, and he is a very, uh, he, he's a mainstay of Washington politics over decades. He would be the first to, to say that. And I think there have been some surprising, if not fully announced departures that his administration has made from the neoliberal meritocratic consensus uh, stretching back from the 90s up through the Obama administration. For example, the push for trade agreements that outsource jobs, that seems to have abated. The enthusiasm for deregulation of the financial industry, that's, uh, although I think we haven't gone far enough in regulating uh, finance, that too has shifted. The meritocratic credentialist emphasis. Joe Biden was the first Democratic nominee for president in 36 years with an, without an Ivy League degree. I think sure. this has oriented him at, at least just intuitively toward a greater concern with the dignity of work and the, the future and prospects of people without a college degree. And in his State of the Union, he spoke explicitly about creating jobs for, for those without a college degree and according more respect. So I, and, and also in the elements of public investment, mm. the CHIPS Act, these were departures from the neoliberal yes. uh, framework. Uh, not to cut you off, but to compare that Go to Ob the Obama administration where it was leaked that the that Citigroup was helping kind of staff his cabinet. I mean, like the, there, it, he, Biden at least has a reflexive kind of distaste for that that mentality that you describe, which I think it is different. I yeah. think this does represent a departure. What hasn't happened yet, and I would also add um, strengthening antitrust action, not only for the sake of lower consumer prices, but also for the sake of uh, dealing with unaccountable economic power, including in the tech industry. That is another gesture toward what I call in democracy's, consent, uh, democracy's discontent, the political economy of citizenship. It's a reach back to that older civic tradition of antitrust. And we've seen that too in the Biden administration. What's missing is a, a full articulation of a new governing public philosophy that acknowledges the failure of the neoliberal market-driven version of globalization, that economic orthodoxy, that acknowledges that the Democratic Party, as well as the Republican Party, was responsible for that and for the widening inequalities it produced, including inequalities of esteem and respect, and a clear public philosophy that aims at a politics of the common good, that aims at the dignity of work, that aims at rebuilding the civic infrastructure, as we've been discussing, of a shared democratic life. We, we need, I think, the kind of political leadership that could articulate the new directions that are implicit, and I think you're right to identify them, implicit in some of the departures from that economic market-driven orthodoxy uh, that we saw prior to the Biden administration. And in a way, uh, one, of, one of my reasons for writing this updated version of democracy's discontent, a new edition for our perilous times, is to try to uh, contribute to the articulation of a new progressive governing philosophy that can, uh, can recall us to this older, but more inspiring, I think, civic understanding of freedom and of citizenship. Well, um, Michael Sandel, uh, the book is Democracy's D Discontent, a new edition for our perilous times. Um, it was written in 1996 or came out then, and it's now like just as relevant and you've updated it. So really appreciate your time today, uh, Michael. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Emma. Thanks very much. Sure. And we'll put a link to the book in the description for the podcast and on our website and everything. Uh, So appreciate it.